Welcome to How to Talk to Kids About Anything with Dr. Robin Silverman, a podcast loaded with practical tips, powerful scripts, personal stories, and simple steps to make even the toughest conversations easier. So get ready to get the information you need to make the impact you want from someone you trust, your friend, parenting expert, Dr. Robin Silverman. Hello and welcome to How to Talk to Kids About Anything, where we give you the tips, scripts, stories, and steps to make even the toughest conversations easier. I'm so honored to be your host, Dr. Robin Silverman, child and teen development specialist, author and speaker, and most importantly, parent of two great kids who give me the opportunity to love, learn, and grow every single day, whether I want to or not. Believe me, I get it. It's not always easy, but we're in this together, and we have some great people helping us along the way. Now let's get honest today. Have you ever said to yourself, I've got it all figured out before you had kids? I will never do that. And now that you have kids, well, you do. I need to time out, a nap, a break. I may look like I've got it all together, but inside I'm a hot mess. Actually, I am a hot mess on the outside too. What is on my shirt? Am I good enough, doing enough, doing it right? What's wrong with me? What's wrong with these children? Are they 18 yet? Well, you've come to the right place. Today, there is no reason to get your zip up pants on or even a clean shirt. You don't have to brush your hair or even pretend that everything is just fine. Thank you very much. You are among friends who get it deeply. Today, we are talking about parenting without perfection and a whole bunch of other really important issues that are often left unsaid. There will be an open confession that, as it says in my next guest book, the happy family life is supposed to be messy. A lifestyle of only perfect moments is not a lifestyle I'm familiar with, nor is it one in which kids can really thrive. Who are we doing this fabulous episode with? Well, she doesn't know it yet, but as I was reading her book, I thought... I could be best friends with this person. Let's see if we can make that happen. And this new bestie's name is Kristen Howerton. Kristen Howerton is a licensed marriage and family therapist and the mother of four children within four years via birth and adoption. She is the founder of the blog Rage Against the Minivan, where in the midst of writing about the raw emotions and experience of motherhood, she has become a fierce advocate for social justice. Kristen has created several popular humor destinations online, including the popular Pinterest You Are Drunk and the hashtag asshole parent meme and Instagram account. Kristen is the co-host of Selfie, a podcast dedicated to exploring the mind, body, and spirit aspects of self-care. Thank you so much for coming on. So Kristen, welcome to How to Talk to Kids About Anything. Well, thank you so much for having me. That was such a lovely introduction. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much. Before we dive into everything, and I was really honest about that bestie comment, before <laughs> we get into everything, before we talk about all the great things that are going on in your book and what you've been writing about, let's talk about what gets you up in the morning and what got you so interested in talking about parenting without perfection and laying it all on the table in a vulnerable and frankly often hilarious way <laughs> well what gets me up in the morning like most parents is my children mm -hmm. right earlier than i want to be <laughs> of course always i was like i used to sleep till 12 or 1 when i was a teenager my kids they were up at 6 45 this morning like, oh what my word is that? <laughs> i have one out of four that will sleep in. The rest are like up at the crack of dawn. Yes. To, to answer your question, I mean, I think, I think what really gets me motivated to, or what got me motivated to share my story is that I felt um, at the time my kids were small, I felt like a lot of people were not being really authentic online mm. about how difficult parenting was. I was seeing a lot of kind of Pinterest curation <laughs> and, you know, breezy Instagram accounts of these like perfect motherhood settings. And I was like, man, I am like, you know, unshowered and struggling and <laughs> barely mm -hmm. making it through the day. Um, and so I just really felt strongly that I wanted to be really honest about the experience of motherhood. And I, I love being a mom. I really do. Um, and there are moments that I find just 
dazzlingly beautiful, Mm -hmm. but there are other moments that I find incredibly difficult. And I wanted to talk about all that, that whole breadth of experience. Mm -hmm. Excellent. And, and it's appreciated throughout your book. In the second chapter of your book, you explain, you explain how you were an amazing mother before you had kids. You oh, say, yeah. yeah, you say, I had it all planned out. I mean, I laughed out loud here, okay? I had it all planned out. There were meadows involved. There would be handmade wooden toys and organic home-cooked meals. There would be picnics on hippie-inspired blankets in the meadows and vintage books and lazy days at the park, more meadows. I knew the kind of mom I'd be breezy. I also knew what kind of mom I wouldn't be. And you explain that you had a friend who had poop on her shirt and didn't seem to care. (laughs) Then something happened. So what happened that changed your perspective on the meadow metaphor? And how has this reality slap been sort of a saving grace for you when grappling with the perfection of parenthood displayed online? Well, you know, I think that I realized that children are still children, even in meadows, right? So, you know, <laughs> they're eating can... the stuff in the meadows. <laughs> oh, totally. They, they've crawled through duck poo. Yes. Trying to put things in their mouth, mm-hmm. you know, and it's, you know, it's that it's that old cliche, wherever you go, there you are. And, you know, you can try to control the optics of motherhood and you can try to make it look breezy, but, and a lot of people do, Mm. a lot of people do that on social media. Um, but then the backstory is that, you know, it probably took a diaper blowout or a tantrum to get there. Um, or if they're teenagers, like I'm parenting now, it probably took a fight and several eye rolls, you know, Mm. and like, mom, this is so lame. (laughs) Um, because children are their own people, you know, they, they are their, their own entities with their own will and and they don't always comply with the picturesque scenes that we plan for them. Yes, they they weren't involved in creating those. You were. Oh. I, I, I was just amazed when you were talking about adopting your son from Haiti and how you had like all these hopes and dreams for him, and he looks like not part of those in the sense that like he didn't have that the same hopes and dreams he didn't he didn't love you back in the beginning he was just like you know who the heck are you and I want to go hang out with my nannies and my friends from from where I was and and you know you're you're expecting the the embrace that the airport like everybody else that you thinks about adoption overseas and yet here you are with this child and it was it was really quite an event to finally adopt him and 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 get to that point where you had that bond, wasn't it? It was. And, you know, I mean, that is a great example of where our our intentions at controlling outcomes and controlling optics as parents can go awry from things as small as, you know, a, a picnic scene we imagine not going well. But then we all know, and the details may be different, that it can also go really wrong in bigger ways and in more profound and disappointing ways. And, you know, one of the ways that that occurred for me is, as you said, when I adopted my, um, it was my second adoption. Mm -hmm. Um, and you know, he had lived in an orphanage for three years and he had never seen a family Mm -hmm. life that wasn't even in his worldview of what family life looked like. You know, uh, the the kids who are being raised in orphanages in most third world countries don't really leave the walls of the orphanage. So that's the only life they know. And so when he came home, you know, I, again, had all, we, we, we create expectations as moms and it's natural. We all do it. Um, and then those ex- expectations are often, you know, n- not based in reality. And my expectation was that, you know, when he came home, it would be lovely and we would finally be a family and he would be, you know, glad to have parents. And he came home and he was at first kind of like, I don't know who you guys are. Mm -hmm. I mean, he knew who we were because we visited a lot, but just like, I don't know about this parenting thing. Like Mm -hmm. I kind of liked it better when I was less supervised Mm -hmm. and when it was a bunch of kids Mm -hmm. kind of, you know, Lord of the flies in the Mm -hmm. orphanage (laughs) and, you know, we didn't have these adults looking after our every move. Um, he, you know, he, he didn't necessarily want parents. Mm-hmm. That wasn't something that he had been pining for because he didn't understand it. And, you know, I mean, this, it's, it's funny to tell this story now because 
this child of mine is now 13 and is probably the most loving of my four, Mm -hmm. probably the most demonstrative, Mm -hmm. um, you know, and we're very bonded, but it took, it took a few years, Mm -hmm. um, of, of me just saying, you know, I, I am a parent and I have to love anyway, which is what we all have to do. All of our kids Mm -hmm. are going to present things Mm -hmm. right that we Mm -hmm. foresee we didn't expect that that we might find challenging um and we love them anyway right you said something like how 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 would a loving mother respond to this right (sighs) something like that in your book and I, I that really actually resonated with me because I I often have to say things like that to myself when I feel emotionally reactive because of course we're going to be emotionally reactive when our child is not doing what we expected or want or hoped for, especially when it's like one of those picturesque thoughts in our head, like you want it so badly to feel like the, like the storybook. And it's, it's so not. No. It's not Pinterest worthy. No. And I think, you know, I think every parent probably has that moment, whether it's a child who struggles in school or a child who has a special need or, you know, a, a moment in, in parenting where, you know, your teenager is really not happy with you, mm-hmm. um, despite your best efforts or your toddler's not happy with you despite your best efforts. And I, I think we've all probably had to have that moment of like, what, you know, what would I do if I felt loving, even though I don't feel loving right now? Because yes. sometimes we don't. And sometimes love is just a verb. Sometimes it's rolling our sleeves up and, and, going through the motions oh, you are so of right. being loving, right? You are so right. I, I really appreciated how frank you were. One of the areas that you were very open about was your miscarriages and the struggles that you had with infertility. And when I read these chapters, I had such an affinity with what you had gone through. Most of my listeners know by now that we adopted both of my children. They're full blood siblings. And I've written about the struggles that I've had with uh, with my kids and, and with ma- miscarriages myself. So I was pregnant four times and had four miscarriages between the years of 2004 and 2008. It was certainly a very dark time in my life where I felt like the shoemaker's daughter, being a child development specialist who couldn't have children and feeling like babies were being given away like popcorn that actually came out of my mouth often as like every one of my chil- my friends were getting pregnant and were having babies with like- uh, yeah. Yeah. Like planned components. Like one of my friends actually said to me, I'll be honest with you, Chris, and she said, well, I'm an Aries, so I know that I don't want to have a Pisces, so I'm going to aim to get pregnant oh, wow. on such and such date. And and she did. Not once, but twice. Wow. So anyway, I it really resonated with me. I, I mean, I couldn't get... I mean, I got pregnant four times over four years. It took me like a year to get pregnant each time, yeah. you know? Yeah. And then I, mm-hmm. you know, had and would have these miscarriages, some of them extremely painful. And thank you for being so detailed with what you wrote in there because that's ex- exactly how I felt and I, I, exactly how I explained it to people. So but let's talk about the unspoken parts of infertility and grief and how you came to adoption. Yeah, um, you know, I think that for people who've mi- who've miscarried, I, you know, I don't think that there is enough talked about in terms of what that experience is like. Mm-hmm. At least I didn't find that to be true. Okay. And so, true. I had had friends who had had miscarriages, you know, mm-hmm. but I didn't realize I didn't realize the physical aspects, and I didn't realize the emotional aspects. Like I was really unprepared mm-hmm. for both. Mm-hmm. You know, I I didn't understand that. You know, you'd go through a mini labor. Yeah. That, when you explained it that way, I was like, oh yes, okay. Yeah. Yes. And it was interesting. I I wrote that chapter, and you know, my editor found it a little bleak and you know, jarring she, probably it's dark that's what she, exactly that's I think the word she used this yeah. is really dark yes. and she was like I don't know I don't know if we should leave this so dark and so I I threw it out to some other moms who had had miscarriages mm-hmm. and every single one of them was like leave this how it is yeah. I want people to know how this is exactly you know, because you don't realize that like you're going to, you, you know, you might be in a weird stage between kind of being pregnant, but not, yes. or that you, you might have lost your baby, but the day, 
you know, the days between the baby, you know, not being viable anymore and then the delivery of that baby could be up to a week. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just, it's a really emotionally and physically difficult endeavor I I found every time. Um, And when you've gone through more than one, Mm -hmm. the emotions are just really devastating. Devastating in a strange way, I think. I mean, for me, I went from, I mean, just, you know, the, the ugly cry, the sob that comes from your toes to Mm -hmm. my third one where I was like, I don't want flowers. I don't want anybody looking at me. Like, don't even come near me to the fourth time when I literally was miscarrying, like miscarrying on stage while speaking in Las Vegas and needed to like, after go to the hospital, have them, you know, shoot me in the butt with a needle and, and just not even like, I don't know. I I was just resolved. I was like, just, yeah, uh, this is just something that happens to me. Like, I mean, I was, it was so, I was so grief written that I like, I couldn't, I couldn't even go there anymore. I was just like, let's just not, you know, it's, it's a really weird experience once you've had multiple ones. Yeah. It is. And then I really struggled because I did go on to carry to term with, I got numb, like you said. Yes. So by the time I carry to term with that pregnancy, I didn't have feelings about being pregnant. Like I didn't have the normal emotions. And you were like, I I missed out in the book. You were like, you're almost like you felt disconnected where everybody's like glowing and like going to the store and doing all that stuff. And you're like, I, I like you're not even there and your doctor's like nope. hey like snap to it girlfriend you're actually having a baby <laughs> like oh, you're yeah doing this. I mean I spent the entire nine months in a state of we'll see what happens exactly we'll I could imagine I, I did that every time I got pregnant after a yeah. while but you're just yeah. like yeah like okay like yeah I'm pregnant but like I, it's probably not going to result in a baby in my case it didn't but like I can imagine for you being eight you know eight months pregnant and still not actually knowing if you're having a baby yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Oh. Yeah. And um, it, despite everyone around me being excited, of course. you know, which, you know, that and that was really hard, I think, for people to understand, which is why I wrote about it so honestly, because I, you know, I just I feel like this is such a misunderstood loss, mm-hmm. you know, and, mm-hmm. and it's dismissed, I think, more than than it probably should be Agreed. in terms of the emotional weight. Agreed. And then you you. You came to adoption and it was not easy. I mean, your adoption process was really challenging. That yeah. first one. I mean, the second one was challenging too, but the, yeah. I mean, it, obviously. Both in their own way. Right, in yeah. their own way. This first one from foster care where mm-hmm. you thought you were you were fostering a child that would be on the fast track to adoption because of right. terminated rights. And then it turns out that a family member came and, you know, was saying that this person was interested in adopting the child after a year of yeah. you, you know, having this child in your house and loving this child and being a mother to this child. And then you don't know, you're back on, you know, these rocks, like, am I, am I adopting mm-hmm. or am I not adopting this child? So mm-hmm. how, what, what was going on there and, and how were you, how were you coping with that such circumstance? I mean, I wasn't coping well, Mm -hmm. you know, I, I, I had been beaten up by infertility and miscarriages and, you know, I desperately wanted to be a mom. Mm -hmm. Um, I had always been open to adoption. So that pivot wasn't difficult. That wasn't for me either. No. Mm -mm. Yeah. Yeah. So I actually always wanted to adopt. Um, so I, you know, I didn't, I didn't have a big, like, you know, having to figure that out like, yeah that was that was just like okay well you yeah. know fourth miscarriage yes uh, okay just do this for, now you, you can know. see why we, i was saying we should be best friends i was like this no, totally. girl totally gets yeah. me and yeah. i get her <laughs> it's like yes exactly no that's exactly how i was mm-hmm. like okay let's let's let's, let's go. do a new let's path. go there. i yeah. actually okay. called my husband who was at the dog park after like the not the fourth miscarriage but like un, you know me trying to figure out what we were doing next and then i called him up and i was like um, I think we should adopt. And he was like, thank God. Like, exactly. I mean, we were all just like, yes. And honestly, yes. like, that was so like, after that, I feel like it was like, you finally saw these signs. I've been <laughs> like, <laughs> how long does it possibly take you to realize that this was the way you were supposed to go? The universe is like screaming at me. And I was like, uh-huh. oh, okay. And it was, 
you know, it just made so much sense after that. Yeah. yeah. No, I felt the same way. Mm-hmm. You know, so when we went into adoption from foster care, I knew because we'd had so much loss that, mm-hmm. you know, I had kind of said to the social workers, like, you know, we we don't want to do foster care. We want to adopt a child mm-hmm. from the foster care system. And right. so, you know, we're really only open to children for whom, it, you know, parental rights have been terminated. Right. And so, and we were open to, you know, up to age six mm-hmm. and we were open to sibling sets, but we ended up getting matched with a, a baby mm-hmm. and, you know, his parental rights had been terminated. And so it was what's considered a fast track adoption, meaning this child is on track for adoption. Mm-hmm even though your foster parents at first. And then lo and behold, about a year into it, uh, a relative, not, not one of his birth parents emerged and, you know, they give, they give precedence to Mm -hmm. relatives. Mm -hmm. And so this relative was, you know, he was supposedly going back for, you know, about a year and a half. It looked like he was going to go back, but then it was like months went on and the relative like hadn't filled out paperwork or hadn't showed up for a meeting or, you know, was expressing interest, but not really, Mm -hmm. which was so infuriating. It's very strange. Almost like, almost like maybe she she was feeling like she should be, should be interested or like maybe was sometimes and not consistent. I I think, I think she was actually getting pressure from a social worker. Oh, yeah. Sure. Yeah. yeah. And so, uh, you know, and it was very frustrating mm-hmm. because we just so desperately wanted him. And I kind of felt like if you want him, show up with yes. your paperwork in hand. Right. You know, right, right. that's what you do when you want a child. Right. <laughs> if my, you know, if I had a relative in care and mm-hmm. it was a child that I was interested in, I would be there at the doorstep of right. social services the next day. Right. Exactly. As early as possible. ID and my paperwork. Right. right. Right, right, um, right. So, you know, it just became more and more apparent that this relative was not actually interested. And mm-hmm. so, but, you know, it was a tumultuous and emotional time, just mm-hmm. not knowing yes. for a really long time and not, and, and then asking myself the questions like, is he really my son? Right. Is this just going to be a baby that I remember? Like, oh, and he never painful. remembers me. Right. Yeah. It and was you're like, really I need to parent as if, like, as if yeah. I'm, I'm his mom. Well, Even there we go. It's like, know. Well, what, what would a loving mother do, yes. even in the moments that I was so scared? Mm-hmm. It's like, I have to love him as if. Right. I have to love him as if he's going to stay with me forever because that's what a baby deserves, mm-hmm. you know? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. He doesn't deserve me crying and distancing myself because I don't know if, you know, he's going to get to stay with me or not. Like, it's mm-hmm. not about me. Right. You know? It was and about- people had, like, some very strange opinions of, like – adoption versus biological children in your world, right? Like it felt like you were pregnant with your, with another child, you wound up, you know, actually coming to term with that yeah. child. And people were like, well, of course you got pregnant right after you adopted. You know? <laughs> yeah. So yeah. Strange. I mean, I got a lot of those messages, you know, people were like, oh my gosh, you know, now you got, of course, now that you adopt, you get pregnant, which really doesn't happen to most people. And it's such you know? a weird thing to say to people. It's yeah, just beyond like, weird. She wasn't, my do- my biological daughter wasn't the prize for having adopted my son. And then, you know, there were, I, I feel like there were some messages of like, well, at least if you lose Jafta, at least you have India. It's like, no, there's no, at least like, oh my this gosh. is my first child. Like I love him the same. Of I would, course. you know, she like, if it's great that I'm, I'm so grateful that I had an, you know, a biological child, but if my first child went back, I would, it would be still a huge insane loss. You know, there's no mitigation there for that kind of a loss. Right. Of course not. And, no. and people feeling like almost like the biological child was a, was the prize for yeah. after you adopting a child. Yeah. That felt yucky yeah. because I, you know, I don't feel that way at all yeah. at all. And I would have been perfectly happy to adopt all of my children. Of course. Of course. Yeah. You admit that when parenting, and you've got four kids and it can be crazy. And it was when you were had so many under four that it felt like every day was Groundhog Day, which I definitely <laughs> totally, I mean, we say that here. We literally say that here, the exact words. Um, we actually watched the movie just recently and, and my, <laughs> my kids were like, oh, this is what you're talking about. Um, I often, you know, I often feel like that between the sibling rivalry. I don't know if you have that, but it's definitely front and foremost in my life. Front sibling rivalry and like, 
persistent whining can, oh my gosh, and, and incessant noise, um, which I know you resonate with, can oh, yeah. sort of bring me to the, my knees some of these days. Um, and then you are left feeling guilty as I sit here and admit this to uh, all these people who are listening in. Um, you feel guilty and you're wondering what's wrong with you, that you're not savoring every moment mm-hmm. and counting your blessings and being fully present. And I don't know if you feel this way too. I feel like I'm just speaking to a kindred spirit, but like when it takes so much to have children, whether you adopt them or not, like you feel like you're not even allowed to feel yes. frustrated because mm-hmm. – it took so much and like yeah. I adopted these children and 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 they I, I, they're the loves of my life and yet I can get so frustrated and and find myself you know frazzled and irritated and and just want to be on my own and alone mm-hmm. you're at the time like you you say in one of your chapters your sister-in-law told you that she she likes to watch her kids sleep and admitted like don't you feel like your kids can't wait for them to wake up and sometimes I'm tempted to just wake them up so I can cuddle with them and play with them to which her thought was like hell no so yeah. what insights did you gather from this time and and how can you advise those who are listening in who I'm sure resonate with this, like to stop feeling guilty and full of shame yeah. that every moment is not perfect. There's no meadows or there are, but they've got poop all over them. And, you mm-hmm. know, that it doesn't always <laughs> look like the Internet says it's going to. Well, first, I think I would say to any mom who had a difficult journey getting to parenthood um, that you have every much as right to complain and whine and have a hard time (laughs) as you know as the community of moms that you live in you know we we are um we are not exempt from finding it difficult you know and i think no matter how we got here there it's it's uniquely challenging to be a parent and to be a mom and we all have to just give ourselves permission you yes. know even th- even those of us who yes are and, and two things can be true at once we can be insanely grateful mm-hmm. for our children and for the journey that brought them to us and we can also be really tired and mm-hmm. speak that mm-hmm. <laughs> those can be true at the same time mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. um and then i think yeah it's just giving ourselves permission to speak that and mm-hmm. i think for myself, a lot of that was giving myself permission around my own introversion, which right was so you know, interesting. Yeah, yeah, and that and that that doesn't it doesn't make us a bad parent if we want to break from our kids. Mm-hmm. It just means that we need to refuel, and right. we don't have to feel guilty if we need to take those breaks. It's okay. It's okay. Well, I mean, I don't know if this happened with you, but. I I can imagine with anybody who's listening in who had their kids home 24-7 during this last, you know, part of the school year, like, you know, we just, it was like family time all the time. Uh And, you know, getting a break and refueling, it was really challenging. Um, and, and you find, and I got a lot of messages from people saying like, I'm finding myself getting so irritable. Oh yeah. Um, Like, you know, I just, I just, I hate everyone. Um, not really, but you know, they, I just, I'm just so frustrated and I feel like a terrible person, but like, I just, I just need to get out of here. And they're always here. My husband and I look at each other, we're like, oh my gosh, they're always here. They're always here while we're trying to work and they're making a lot of noise and we don't know what to do with ourselves. So, you know, I think you're right. We need to be able to give ourselves permission to feel whatever we're feeling, to feel the frustration and to know that we're not crazy. We're not bad people because it's happening. And certainly in the time when things are really bizarre and we are, you know, need, need to be with our children 24 seven, that it's not going to be, you know, like the Partridge family where, you know, you get to live and work together and everything's fine. Yeah, absolutely. It's not. Yeah. And, um, I, you know, I feel the same way that like, you know, the last few months, mm-hmm. it was really challenging. Yes. I mean, I, I found myself struggling to sleep at night just yes. because I hadn't had, I mean, of course, some of it is the stress of, you know, what's happening in the world, of course. but some of it is just like, my brain can't shut off because I haven't been alone and yes. I don't even know how long. Right. Yeah. yeah. I and mean, just being on call. Learn. Yes. 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 And, you know, and having to, you know, I, I had to work through the whole 
you know, quarantine. Me too. Time, so yeah. To speak. Yeah. So it was funny. I mean, I'm so watching hard. people on Instagram baking bread and I'm like, oh I my don't gosh, know that life. The breaking, I, like, ba- I was trying to bake bread at the same time, like almost like, I mean, I wasn't baking bread, but like, yeah. I still like remember my daughter being like, mom. And I'm like up here, you know, in my office working, mom. I'm yes. like, yeah. She's like, can you come down and help me bake cookies? And I'm like, oh my gosh, like I, yeah. I actually can't. And how I wish I could. Like, I wish yeah. I could, but I so can't. And I'm almost irritated right now that you're asking me this because yes. I I need to be able to, you know, concentrate on this presentation that I'm writing that I need to do online now, not in Las Vegas, you know, but uh, it, it is, it's so challenging to, I, I saw people literally baking something different every single day. I'm right. just amazed by that life. Well, wow. You know, and, and there is that per- pervasive, you know, guilt and mom yes. guilt and mom comparison too because I felt like I'm watching people do all of these lovely things lovely. with their kids Beautiful. and I'm like all I've done today is stared at a computer screen yes. and then yelled from the computer yes. screen directives to my kids yeah like that's what quarantine looked like for me yeah no I get <laughs> it and and it is hard not to feel guilty I got I for me it wasn't so much the baking of the bread but like people who were basically going out to meadows and, you know, yeah. taking pictures yeah. of their kids jumping and, you know, yeah. having their hair just perfectly right. And, and I, I, I was like, I don't know if my child has brushed her hair today. And I'm really, you know, I'm not sure exactly what's going on downstairs. So there's a lot of noise and yes. I'm sure there's a huge <laughs> mess, uh, but I'm oh, yeah. not really sure exactly what's going on, but it's, I, I can't, I just tell my kids, I can't do all the things. Like, I I, right. I want to do all the things, but I cannot do all the things. I know. No, you can't. No. You can't. And I think, you know, my book has had a message of letting ourselves off the hook, and I had to follow that advice during quarantine. Oh, so like, I just it's just going to be messy. It's yeah. going to be a hot mess. It was messy. Yeah, it was messy. messy. The house was messy. messy. The, gra- the grades weren't the best. Yeah. <laughs> you know, no, I, I, my it, it turned out work it didn't matter. work wasn't the best. Yes. <laughs> no, I, I completely get it. I... So, you know, during that, during the quarantine, obviously, you know, there's, there was a whole lot going on and I I mean, I did get to interview some really amazing people. One of them was Nefertiti Austin and she, she was recently on the podcast and she was talking about raising a black son in today's world. She also adopted her son from foster care. And since you have two black sons, one who you adopted from foster care, one who you adopted from Haiti, as well as two biological children who are fair-skinned. You tell us about racism that you've witnessed and parents who have made assumptions about how to best raise kids who don't see color or who, quote unquote, can't be racist because we don't mention skin color. And you say sometimes good kids from non-racist homes can have moments of being terrible. You told some really interesting stories. I'd love to hear them here. What insights can you give us about how to raise kids who are anti-racist, who understand more about racism, who can support their friends, who might be on the receiving end of racism? Since you have a unique perspective, given that you have two black sons and you have two children who are fair skinned and you've seen, seen it sort of from all angles. Yeah, I mean, I think one of the most problematic things I see in terms of messaging that kids are getting is don't talk about race. Like, yeah. don't mention, don't, <clears throat> we're colorblind, mm-hmm. everyone's human, we don't notice race, mm-hmm. we don't talk about race. Mm-hmm. Which sends a subtle message, especially to white children, you know, that race is problematic. Like, oh, well, if we can't talk about this, there must be something taboo, bad, yes. right? Like, there must be mm-hmm. something bad. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, I've had so many parents over the years tell me stories, especially when the kids were all younger, of like, you know, so, you know, my child doesn't even notice your child's race. Like, she mm-hmm. didn't even know your child was adopted. And mm-hmm. it's like, well... I think they notice that they have brown skin. They mm-hmm. may not understand genetics yet. But mm-hmm. like it's it it's not an insult if your child notices my child is brown. Right. Like 
Mm-hmm. That's not bad. That right. we're not looking for. I mean, that's Sesame child. Street, isn't it? Like, right. That's basically like this. This. This is brown. This is purple. This is yellow. Totally. Like, we're yeah. okay with it, right? Yeah, we're totally okay with it. And you know, my kids are very proud to be black. And I, you know, I, I don't want people to feel like they can't acknowledge that aspect of them. So I, you know, I think we have some work to do as white people in just becoming comfortable about talking about race mm-hmm. because <clears throat> we've gotten these messages that say, you know, and I think they were well-meaning messages, mm-hmm. but they're just, they're not working for us. This colorblind notion is not working for us. We need to acknowledge race. We need to talk about race. We need to listen to the experiences of people who are, are different, you know, um, we, li- we need to listen to the experiences of people of color as white people Absolutely. so that we can understand um, how their how their experience is different from our own. Mm-hmm. And so that we can empathize because mm-hmm. that's really the goal is mm-hmm. empathy. I know you you had mentioned in your book and this resonated with me because I did this. You're saying, you know, get make sure you're purchasing dolls that have different skin color um, as a as a body image expert, I was <laughs> I had written a book on body image, and my daughter was like interested in Barbies at the time. I'm like, I am getting every different color. I am getting mm-hmm. you know every different size. There was like a uh, plus size Barbie. There yeah. were small ones. There were teen ones. There were you know Lottie dolls that had like different ethnicities and different interests. I was like, I'm getting. We're going to get a whole cross section, you know, so when she was playing with them, she had like all these different ones to play with because I was like, how am I going to, you know, allow her to do what she's interested in doing without me cringing every time she's doing it because everybody looks the same. But what were some of your your ideas for how we can help to incorporate more of a diversity in the lives of of our children and ourselves so that we we're not just talking about racism we're actually doing something yeah i mean i think from a young age it's uh, you know as you mentioned it's making sure that diversity is reflected in the home so mm-hmm. doing an audit of your books doing an audit of the dolls doing an audit of the shows that your kids watch mm-hmm. and making sure that all of them represent um people of color, you know, black people, Asian people, Latin people, mm-hmm. um, that, you know, that you are really representing the, the wide array of people in our world. Um, and then I think as, you know, as kids get older, I mean, I think it's also really important to have them in diverse settings. And mm-hmm. so, you know, making sure that you are putting yourself out there and that your friend groups reflect mm-hmm. the diversity that's in the world. And that if you, if you are, routinely and regularly in all white spaces, asking yourself some hard questions. Mm. You know, do we need to look at a different school setting? Mm, mm. Do we need to look at a different church? Do we need, you know, what what is going on in our life if everywhere we go all the time is all white? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yes, yeah, is really important. And I think it was really wise of you to talk about that, those tough questions. You know, what, why is it that way? And what do you need to be doing differently? And are you housing some racist views or are you having that birds of a, of a feather kind of thing in your head, making yeah. it so that you're just, you know, as as you said in your book, like boys typically hang out with boys, girls typically hang out with girls. But like, you know, do we have to have everybody segmented in all of these different ways where you know, these, these kids are going to hang out together and these, like, we need to do some kind of, um, we have to look at it in in a different way and see how we can infuse some diversity into our lives and, and know that we'll be better for it. Isn't that right? Mm Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Because I think, you know, you mentioned this part of the book. I mean, I, I said that I, I think we want to believe that racism is only taught and that any kid who acts in a racist way, um, you know, has parents who have taught them to be racist. But I think that sometimes kids exclude based on appearance and gender and and disability. Mm -hmm. Uh, You know, they exclude children who are different. Mm -hmm. They do. Mm -hmm. And it's it's a very terrible exercise in power and exclusion that kids go through. But, you know, we've all seen 
kids on a playground be like, no, girls only. Mm-hmm. Or, you yes. know, we've seen kids make fun of a kid with glasses. That doesn't happen because the parents have said, we hate people with glasses, <laughs> right? <laughs> or no parent has sat a kid down and said, now don't ever let a boy come into your play group if it's just girls, you know? Right. Kids can be terrible, yes. all of our kids. Right. And they are getting subtle messages about race from our environment. They are. Right. And... Um, and they're getting subtle messages from us. If we don't have friends of color, then what are we modeling right. for them? And I think it's, I think along those same lines, you know, you have to shut it down when you see it. And, and so much of the time, and even in the stories that you tell in your book, it's like parents are in so much of denial yeah. when they hear that their child has done something awful or said yeah. something awful, like it can't be my kid, right? When yeah. it's really an opportunity to say, all right, my child's four years old. And in this case, like in one of the stories of your book where, you know, you're talking about the, the basketball um, activity and you're, nobody wanted to hold your son's hand because he was black or brown or whatever they said. We don't want to touch brown people or whatever the kid said. I mean, it was awful. Um, that the parents were just, you know, you're talking about a four-year-old child or five-year-old child. Like, you know, get you, you have to get to a point where you're like, the child's been on earth for four four years, five years. Like, right. they know nothing. It's like, I mean, right. they know some things, but they don't know much. And that's fine. So, like, you know, it's not even something to be offended by. It's something to like, oh, okay, I guess I haven't really talked about that. Like, let's talk about that and take it as an opportunity. Is it embarrassing? It can be embarrassing, but then just cop to it and be like, you know what? Like, I I need to do something about that. Thank you for telling me, right? I mean, at some point, you just yeah. have to kind of take it in and realize, as you said in the beginning, like, life is messy. Our kids are not going to be perfect. We're so far from perfect, clearly. Right. You know, we're wearing poop on our shirts. So... You know, we need to do something about this. Yeah, and I think white parents need to not be so defensive that at, at the idea that their child could do something racist. Now, yeah. that doesn't mean their child is a racist. Right. Oh, that's but, really different. That's that's something to take in right there. They could do something racist, but that yeah. doesn't necessarily mean that they are racist. Let's put high right. beams on that. Yes. Yeah, but I think you know, it's, it's well within the realm of possibility that a white child will do something racist Mm -hmm. in their childhood. Mm -hmm. It's, you know, that, that could happen. And then we, we look at it and we adjust and we have a talk and we go, okay, let's, you know, let's have a chat about why, you know, when, um, you guys were all playing and then that child who didn't speak English as well as all of you came along, you told them that they couldn't play Mm -hmm. or, you know, whatever it looks like, um, that we just, we acknowledge that our kids might, might behave in ways that are, not anti-racist. Right. Okay. Really, really good discussion on that. So you also talk about this whole idea of like this hashtag asshole parent movement you (laughs) created. Um, Can you tell us a little bit more about what that is and how you think, and I believe it did, helped to release some of the tension around perfect parenting? Yeah. I mean, so I was having one of those moments with my daughter. Um, It was just the two of us, my youngest. The older kids had gone off to school, and she was very bored and lonely because all of her siblings are in school and she's not. And so there was one day where I was trying to have, like, a special lunch with her, and I had put everything on a pink plate. We had, like, (laughs) leftovers from a birthday party. So it's like, you're getting lunch on a pink plate, and it's cut in puzzle shapes, and here's a pink cup, and you can wear your princess dress, and you can invite all of your stuffed animals to lunch. And it was just this cute little scene. (laughs) But then it was a Pinterest scene. It was a Pinterest (laughs) scene. I'd like cut her grapes down the middle and I'd made her a pink smoothie. But then I put a yellow straw into the pink smoothie. You're a horrible person. She lay down on the ground (laughs) and cried because of the pink, uh, the you know, the yellow straw. Like, how dare I? I mean, really? So, and I remember just thinking, like, I cannot do anything right. Like, it doesn't matter how hard I try. They think I'm an asshole Mm -hmm. no matter what I try. Yep, absolutely. Yeah, and so that's where asshole parents was birthed, was Mm -hmm. this this idea that, you know, despite our best efforts, you know, one of us is going to hand a kid a broken granola bar and they're going to lay on the floor about it. There's clearly cannot be edible at that point once it breaks. Oh, gosh. I mean, it's broken in half. It's like throw the whole thing Not even in half. Like it might even be like not quite half, which makes it worse. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, just 
burn it down. So I started, you know, I started like sneaking photos of my kids in moments where they were throwing a fit over something so ridiculous, like, you know, a piece of cilantro and a burrito. Mm -hmm. And I started, you know, describing what happened and then using the hashtag asshole parents. And then it just took off and people started doing it. But and I think that there was this sort of camaraderie of like, you know, we have to laugh about it. Like, mm-hmm. you have to laugh about it, right. you know, because it is comical. It, it is. And it's not it's just your universal. kid. It is universal. Yeah. It is every kid. It is every kid that, you know, and, and we all know it because we go to the store and the kid is lying on the ground and yeah. having a tantrum. And we're like, yep, like I've yep. been there. Uh, yeah. And the people who look at you with, you know, that look of disgust either don't have children or don't remember because it's just... <laughs> But it's it's been everybody's child that has yeah. had a tantrum in a in a you know random place. It might even been on your kitchen floor, but still, <laughs> they they it happened, and it may have yeah. happened over a yellow straw, or you yep. cut the sandwich wrong, or you know their, their sister took something that you know they wanted, but never they, did they express it. It just you know. Yeah, that or, or the best, my, my favorite is when the fit is over you like saving them from death, right? Like, so the fit is that you, you know, you won't let them play with a power tool or stick a fork into an outlet. <laughs> right. And stand on the countertop. Like, how right, dare like, you? How monster. dare you? Monster. Yeah. No, I love that part. Um, before we get to the end, I you mention in your book, the this idea of having mom friends and, and taking risks to to acquire them. Uh, mm-hmm. I feel like I definitely need lessons in this. I mean, I speak to people all the time and, you know, I present and I, um, <laughs> and I'm talking to amazing people on my podcast, but I often feel the way that you describe where you're like, I don't really have too many people like right here in, in my midst. Um, to, to, uh, like when you're like, we go on vacations together. I'm like, I definitely don't have that. Like, I would love that. That's like a dream come true. So what are your, like, what's your advice for parents who are feeling lonely and are seeking real friends, but aren't really sure how to acquire them because everybody else looks maybe kind of perfect or they have their friend group already or whatever the, the case may be. Yeah, I mean, I think I've been there. And I think it is, I mean, this, the sad reality is, it's something that you just you have to work at, like the way that you would work at any goal, like if it's a goal to make more friends. um, And and this is exactly what I did is you have to literally put that goal on your to do list, Mm -hmm. and figure out what you're going to do to meet that goal. And for me, what that looked like was I really put myself out there, like super awkwardly, like dating, right? Like, yes, you know, and it is like dating. It's Mm -hmm. like, you're not going to find a partner if you stay at home, like, you know, and and it's funny that we, we sort of get that about, about dating, right? Like that you have to put yourself out there and you have to, you know, you've, you you might have to, it might be awkward and it might be forced at first, but you have to go out there and, you know, figure out the things to do to find the partner. But we don't do that with friendships. No, because you think you're just going to meet somebody in a meadow. Right. Well, like, and, and it's because it, it, it is organic. It's like Anne or Green of Gables or whatever. Like you're yeah. like, oh, my bosom buddy, <laughs> like right well, in the middle like of the you meadow. We never had to work for them because you just find your friends in elementary school. Well, you my find mom told me you that you're going, don't worry, you'll find your mom friends when you have like when you have kids and like the kids at preschool or you're like or in kindergarten or whatever, Like it will be you know, really obvious. And I'm like. Like I, I have, there are nice people here. There's no question. There's people I, you know, even see, but like what you described about having this like mom group with like people who go on vacation together and hang out and n- no, like I definitely don't see that happening yet. And um, I'm, I was really like, wow, that, that sounds amazing. But yeah, I mean, to get there because I didn't have it. I mean, I, I can remember a point when my son was in first grade, I was like, I don't have the number of a single other parent at this school. Mm -hmm. Like if there was like an early out day or I needed, uh, you know, I needed someone to grab my kid in an emergency. Like Mm. I didn't know a single other parent Mm -hmm. and I hated that. And so I, um, I mean, I wrote about this in the book. Like one thing that I did was I, um, invited all of these moms from the school to have mimosas at my house the first day back of school. Right, right, right. And so I just like, I, I invited literally everyone. And 
like 50 women showed up. Yeah. And That's then, pretty impressive. But then what happened was five women lingered. Yes. And those, and those, that group, about half of those women are like my best, my ride or die. Now. Mm, so great. Yeah. So great. But I had to really, really put myself out there. Like, yeah. and you know, it would, this looked like me sitting in my house with mimosas wondering if anyone would come. Oh, I mean, gosh. it was really, you were oh, a risk taker. I love it. I think that is outstanding. You put yourself out there like that. Well, you know, what's funny. I'm actually not really a risk taker. I'm a goal setter. Mm -hmm. And, I, and I really didn't like doing that, but I knew if I really had to tell myself if friends are what I want, and I did, I desperately wanted it, mm -hmm. then I have to make goals for it the same way that I make goals for I'm going to write a book or I'm going to, you know, anything else in life. Like I have to make a to do list for how I'm going to make friends. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's what I did. That's awesome. That's awesome. So give us your top tip. What do you want? the people who are listening in to come away with after listening to what you have to say about learning to parent without perfection? You know, my biggest tip, and I write, I write about how I did this specifically in my book um, in terms of what I did, but I think it's different from for every mom. But my biggest tip is that you have to figure out what you're opting into and what you're opting out of mm. as a mom, because mm. we cannot do it all, right? Mm. We can't be... We can't be the PTA president and be an entrepreneur that runs our own business and be the hippie yoga mom and be, you know, the domestic goddess whose house is always perfect. Like we, we have to figure out what our lane is and what are the things that we're giving up in order to have the things we want. And it's different for every mom. But I think we have to figure those things out. And we have to opt out of some of those expectations of motherhood. Mm, that's such a great one. And, and you know, uh, the caveat is also, like, let's not judge other parents for having yes. a different view exactly. of what they're opting in and out of. You know, you're, exactly. if, if you, you know, you know the, the people who are the PTA um, presidents or treasurers and, and yep. involved in that way, and, and that is awesome. We know the parents who are... Them. <laughs> yes, parents that are stay at home who, who yeah. you know, do all the, the great Pinterest things. And I, I'm so impressed with what they do or the parents who are working and just trying to stay above water. And it just, there's all different kinds of moms and, and dads. And we just have to kind of salute them and say, you do you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right? Yeah. That is the truth. That yeah. is the truth. And, you know, I think sometimes the reason that we do judge other moms is really out of jealousy mm -hmm. is it's really that we are feeling badly that we're not doing the things that they are doing. Mm -hmm. And when we can really let ourselves off the hook and when we can really make a conscious effort and say, you know, I'm choosing, I'm choosing to opt out of being on the PTA. Mm -hmm. And when I, when it's my choice, then I don't feel the need to judge a woman who's opted in. Mm -hmm. Right. And mm -hmm. so when we're, when we are more conscious with our choices, I think it does reduce our mommy wars because then we can say, yeah, I've, you know, I've chosen this and she's chosen that. And that's great. Yeah. We need all kinds. We like, we yeah. need people who are, you know, baking the cupcakes. We do. We, we do. And we need the people who are, who are taking care of the kids. And I, I yep. like to, you know, bring food to people. Everybody's got a different, you know, yes. thing that they're doing. Um, yep. We're all just trying to do our best. Give us the resource of the week. Where can we go to get more information about you, your book, and the great work you're doing? Yeah, it's all linked up at my website, which is kristenhowerton.com. And I'm also on Instagram. Um, my personal account is Kristen Howerton, at Kristen Howerton. And then... Um, the, all of the asshole parents um, memes are curated at at Rage Against the Minivan on Instagram. Well, awesome. Thank you so much for being on the show today, Kristen. I loved what you had to say about adoption, about infertility, about letting things go, opting out, opting in, uh, asshole parents. It was such an interesting conversation. Um, there were, you know, times where we really got into some deep things and some really funny things. So uh, I really enjoyed myself and I hope you did too. So thank you for I being really on the show. Did. 
Oh, oh it was my pleasure. I'm so glad. Well, I've got my takeaways and sweet friends, I know you have yours, so let's discuss them. Come up on Facebook. You can go to the Dr. Robin Silverman page or let's chat about it at drrobinsilverman.com or twitter.com slash drrobin. I'm also on Instagram under Dr. Robin Silverman. I'll be going back and forth with Kristen um, uh, talking about all these great things that we've been discussing today, also creating memes with some of her amazing quotes. I will slap them on those memes. You can share them all over social media so that other people can learn about these funny things, these interesting things, these really important things. And if you love this podcast like I did, I hope you'll go up to iTunes and rate and review it so other people can learn about these solutions and these insights and use them in their own homes. I truly appreciate it. That's all the time we have for today, my fellow parents, leaders, and educators. Thank you so much for tuning in to How to Talk to Kids About Anything. For more information on books, articles, speaking engagements, or curriculum, please visit drrobinsilverman.com. There's so many great podcasts up there, and the show notes to this podcast will be up there as well. I look forward to weathering the storms and enjoying the sunny side of life together. And please remember, even on the days when you fall short, you've got this, you're here, you're getting the information you need. I know it's not easy, but never forget there's always tomorrow. Parenting is the ultimate do-over. Perhaps you heard something today and you're thinking, oh my goodness, I, don't, I, I now have some new perspective on that mess up that I made, that mistake, the, what happened with my kid. I have some new things to apply to my life about racism or adoption or foster care. That's awesome. You can always do something different. You can take this information and apply it to your life and enrich it and make it better. You don't have to be bashing yourself. There's always time for the do-over. I see you and I'm right there with you. And as there are moments when we doubt our know-how, our choices, and our sweet sanity, please know you are 10 times the parent you think you are. Until next time, this is Dr. Robin Silverman with How to Talk to Kids About Anything. Please tune in again and keep connecting through conversation. See you next week. You've been listening to How to Talk to Kids About Anything with Dr. Robin Silverman. For more information on books, articles, speaking engagements, or curriculum, please visit drrobinsilverman.com.